Convertible bonds give bondholders the option to exchange the bond for a specific number of shares of the issuer's common stock. At issuance, the offer document will define some of the key terms of the bond. Other than the usual coupon rate and frequency and maturity date of the bond, the offer document will also state the following. The conversion period, that is the specified valid period where the bondholder is allowed to exercise the conversion. The conversion price is the price per share at which the bond may be converted to common stock. For illustration, let us set the conversion price at $40. Given the conversion price, we can work out the conversion ratio, which is the par value of the bond divided by the conversion price. For our example, the conversion ratio is 25. This means that one bond can be converted to 25 common shares. Take special note of this ratio, as we'll be needing it for the analysis later. While the conversion ratio is fixed at issuance, some corporate actions such as stock splits, large dividend payouts or mergers and acquisitions after the issuance of the convertible bond may be unfair to the convertible bond holders. As such, offer documents may also include clauses to protect the interest of the investors. For stock splits, the conversion ratio may be adjusted to account for the effect of the split. For example, if there was a two-for-one split, the conversion ratio should be doubled. Likewise, for unusually large dividends that are above a specified threshold dividend, the conversion ratio may be adjusted upwards to account for the fall in stock price after the dividend payout. For mergers and acquisitions, a contingent put option may be embedded to allow the bondholder to return the bond to the issuer after the change of control. Such put options can be hard puts, that is the issuer must redeem using cash only, or soft puts, where the issuer can decide whether to redeem the bond for cash, stock, subordinated debt, or a combination of the three. Most convertible bonds are also callable giving the issuer the right to call the bond prior to maturity. This can be a tool for issuers to force bondholders to convert when the value of their shares increase above the conversion price. The forced conversion strengthens the issuer's capital structure. For investors, buying a non-callable or non-puttable convertible bond is equivalent to buying an option-free bond with an embedded call option on an amount of the common stock equal to the conversion ratio. In this case, the conversion ratio is 25, so this is a call option on 25 shares. Be very clear, this is a call option on the stock, not the bond. Since the investor is long the call option, the value of a convertible bond is simply the value of a straight bond plus the value of call option on the stock. If the convertible bond is callable, we subtract the value of the call option on the bond. We subtract here because the issuer exercises the call option, so the investor is short the option. And if the convertible bond is also puttable, we add on the value of the put option. Again, add here because the investor is long the put option. For simplicity, we shall just consider the case of non-callable and non-puttable convertible bonds for the rest of this lesson. The straight value of a convertible bond is the option-free value of the equivalent bond. This value can be determined based on the market price of comparable straight bonds, but more often than not, the arbitrage-free value of the bond based on its future cash flows and market discount rate should suffice. For example, if at this point the bond has three years to maturity and pays fixed annual coupon of $60. Assuming a flat yield curve of 2.5%, the value of the underlying option-free bond must be $1,100. This value should be compared to conversion value, which is related to the stock price. The conversion value of a convertible bond is the value of the common stock that is received by the bondholder if he makes the conversion. It is simply calculated as the price of each share times the conversion ratio. For instance, if at this point each share is trading at $50,
the conversion value of the convertible bond is $1,250 at this instance. At any point in time during the conversion period and before conversion, the minimum value of a convertible bond is the higher of the conversion value and the straight value of the bond. So, at this point, the minimum value of the convertible bond is the conversion value, which is $1,250. It's not hard to see why. For example, at this point, if the market price of the convertible bond is $1,220, an arbitrageur can buy the bond and immediately convert into 25 shares and sell all the shares at $1,250, immediately pocketing $30 risk-free. The price of the bond has to be minimally $1,250 to eliminate arbitrage opportunity. So let's say the market price of the convertible bond is $1,300, and if the investor buys the convertible bond at this point, we're able to calculate the effective price per share the investor paid by dividing the bond price by the conversion ratio. This is known as the market conversion price or conversion parity price, which works out to $52. The investor effectively paid $52 for each share when he buys the convertible bond instead of the stock. From this price, we can calculate the market conversion premium per share, which is simply the difference between the market conversion price and the market price of the shares. The market conversion premium ratio can also be calculated. For our example, the premium per share is $2 and the premium ratio is 4%. Now, you may be wondering, why would anyone effectively pay $52 for a share that's trading at $50 in the market? That's because buying convertible bonds instead of stocks limits downside risk. Remember this minimum value of the convertible bond? When the price of the stock is low, the minimum value of the convertible is its straight value, which is often much less volatile than the stock price. So for an investor that's worried about downside risk, but would like to participate in the upside of the stock, he would buy and hold on to the convertible bond instead of the common shares. The premium that he pays here can be seen as a premium he pays for the downside protection. One measure of the downside risk is the premium over straight value, calculated as the price premium of the convertible bond's market price and its straight value. In this case, we have earlier calculated the straight value at $1,100. The premium over straight value here is 18.2%. The higher this premium, the higher is the downside risk of the bond. However, do be aware that this measure is somewhat flawed as the straight value of the bond can vary with changes in market interest rate and credit quality of the issuer. So, back to our example, let's say the investor buys the convertible bond at $1,300 while the stock investor buys 25 shares at $50 each. One year later, the share price falls to $30 so the conversion value of the bond correspondingly drops to $750. Let's say the straight value of the bond falls to $1,060. Given that the minimum value of the convertible bond is maximum of the two values, its value is minimally $1,060. The investor has only lost at most 18.5%. In comparison, the investor who invested directly in the stocks would have lost 40% instead. Here we see the downside protection of the convertible bond at play. From this illustration, we can observe that when the stock's price falls, the returns on convertible bonds exceed those of the stock because the convertible bond's price has a flaw equal to its straight bond value. However, if the price of the shares rose to $60 one year later, the conversion value of the bond would correspondingly rise to $1,500. This is the new minimum value of the convertible bond. The minimum gain to the bond investor would be 15.4%. Comparatively, the stock investor would have made 20% gain instead.
So, as you can see here, the bond investor is also able to participate in the equity upside. However, the gain is lower because of the market conversion premium. Effectively, the bond investor paid $52 per share, so his gain is lower than the stock investor who bought at $50. One shortcut to calculate this gain is to use the market conversion price as his initial price per share. From this scenario, we can observe that when the stock's price rises, the convertible bond will underperform because of the conversion premium. This is the main drawback of investing in convertible bonds versus investing directly in the stock. You're watching an excerpt from our comprehensive animation library. For more videos like these, head on down to prepnuggets.com. At Prep Nuggets, let us do the hard work for you.